Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what a pleasure it is to be back here in uh, Wagner and der Wildnis, or at least in sort of the continuation of Wagner and der Wildnis. And what a particular pleasure to be talking about Lohengrin. Um, Lohengrin, of course, is one of those operas that made Wagner's name. Uh, between the 1850s and the 1870s, this was the opera that became very widely performed, first in Germany and then later uh, in other countries. And in fact, um, it has remained one of the most frequently performed of all his music dramas until, uh, in fact, until 1930. In fact, from after his death in 1882 through to 1930, it was the most widely performed of all of Wagner's operas. However, not all cities were quite as welcoming to his works uh, as, as others were, and the real, ex, the real sort of resistance to uh, Wagner among in European cities in particular was Paris. Uh, Wagner had a cataclysmic start when, mainly for political reasons, uh, the production of Tannhäuser uh, that took place in the uh, um, uh, the opera received a tumultuous and hostile reception. Um, here we have a picture of Wagner um, assaulting a gendarme, somewhat of a fantasy picture, I think. I'm not quite so sure Wagner would have been out in the streets brawling like this, but it gives you some idea of the controversy and the hostility that Wagner's operas initially received in Paris. Um, so much for Franco-German relations, which were at a pretty low point. This um, uh, production, by the way, was in 1861. Now, after 1861, uh, Paris, rather interestingly, became a centre of Wagnerism. Uh, his works were very widely described among the intelligentsia and the literati of the city. Uh, there were publications, there were periodicals devoted to Wagner. But interestingly enough, his works were rarely seen in Parisian opera houses uh, for the next uh, 30 years. In fact, there are really only two instances of Wagner productions in the 30 years following the Tannhäuser Cataclysm. Uh, the first of these was uh, Rienzi, which was first performed at the Théâtre Lyrique, a, a private theatre, in 1869. And then, interestingly enough, the other production was uh, Lohengrin, which was first performed at the uh, Théâtre Eden, or the Eden Theatre, in 1887. Now, these two productions, uh, the only production seen of Wagner at that time in Paris, um, were actually uh, passed without public disturbance. But this was not the case when Lohengrin was ultimately produced Paris Opera in September of 1891. The Paris Opera was a state subsidized company and it had, it was highly prestigious, considered one of the leading institutions of France. And the presence of a German opera, particularly one by Wagner on its stage, was not to everybody's ple uh, pleasure. Uh, for example, um, the uh, performance began with riots in the squares outside the opera house, as we can see here in this uh, picture from Le Petit Journal. And here we have uh, from, uh, an, an, uh, uh, from another uh, uh, newspaper, uh, we have um, the, another p uh, report on the riot and the statement that a thousand prisoners were taken during the riot outside the uh, Paris Opera House when Learn was about to be performed. Um, uh, the, actually, one is assured that they were actually sort of uh, pretty quickly sort of just wrapped on the knuckles and were sent home. But most of these riots were mot motivated primarily by anti-German nationalist sentiment. Interestingly enough, the production of Lohengrin that went on in the opera was tremendously successful. It had a popular run, and over the next 20 years, all of Wagner's major works were performed at the, uh, the opera. And by the time we get to 1914, along with Verdi, he was the most popular opera composer in the repertoire of the opera. Um, in many ways, it's not a coincidence. In fact, it's rather relevant, I think, that it was Lohengrin was the first of Wagner's works to grab the imagination of the uh, Parisian theatre goers. 
Uh, of all his works, it is the one that actually demonstrates the greatest influence of French grand opera in its setting and of French dramaturgy, that means the sort of the, the, the dramatic structure, French dramaturgy in, in, in its actual sort of um, uh, structure. Um, at the same time, Wagner uses this setting and this dramatic scaffolding to present a story that actually deeply touches upon many uniquely German issues. Uh, and while Wagner was widely and, and justifiably seen as anti-French in, in many of his uh, political pronouncements, in, in Lohengrin, we might say France and Germany for once could be seen as working in artistic partnership. Well, it's customary to regard Lohengrin as the peak of German romantic opera, and there's no denying that it is. But it also has an equal salience in the development of European grand opera, uh, a genre that is related but is somewhat different from romantic opera uh, and not always identical with it. Uh, let me begin by talking about what I call the French Lohengrin. Today, we're accustomed to regarding grand opera as covering the entire genre of opera. We think referred grand opera, opera is by definition grand. Um, in fact, grand opera can be defined quite specifically. Let me just give a very quickly a sort of a thumbnail sketch of what we mean by grand opera. Uh, first, grand opera is a term that is applied to operas that were written primarily in France between 1825 and 1870. Now there are grand operatic works afterwards, but 1825 to 1870 is the, sort of the period of the flowering of grand opera. Most of the grand of the operas of this time were associated with the Paris Opera, the major uh, uh, opera house in, uh, in, in uh, the, the French capital. Uh, next, most grand operas were in five acts. And one of the reasons for this, I've come from, at least is what certain historians say, is because Shakespeare wrote plays in five acts. And there was sort of a, a, a grand, uh, Shakespeare was associated with a certain grandiosity on the stage. And this was something that grand opera was trying to play off. Uh, in, 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 interestingly enough, um, uh, Lohengrin, although actually it's formally in three acts, it can in many ways be seen as being sort of divided into five different sections. So there is that Shakespearean quality to it. And I'll explain that later. Uh, next, uh, Grand Opera uh, uses historical settings usually the European uh, Middle Ages and the Renaissance, uh, sometimes ancient Rome, sometimes uh, one or two other uh, fantastic uh, uh, environments. But historical settings were particularly important. The imp now, this is a crucial thing. The grand opera involved immense spectacle, hyper-realistic sets, lavish costumes, flashy lighting, and catastrophic ending. Um, and and uh, the, the catastrophe at the end of the grand opera was something that all audiences look forward to. Uh, the ballet was de rigueur. Interestingly enough, we do not have a ballet in, uh, in Lohengrin. That is one aspect of the grand opera uh, that it, the work does not uh, uh, re resemble. But um, the Grand Opera had massive orchestra and extended choruses, and musically it tended to be quite eclectic. Um, it was immensely popular. Uh, it made Paris the capital of the operatic world. Productions were gigantic and uh, technically immensely skilled. The technology of the theater was really quite remarkable. Uh, composers and opera artists went to Paris to make their names. Wagner went to Paris to see if he could make his name as a grand operatic composer. So too did Verdi. Verdi was being a more successful at it, actually. Um, were breathtakingly beautiful. Let's look for just a moment at Act Two of Maya Beer's Les Huguenots, uh, which um, is, uh, was first performed at the opera in 1836. Uh, we have this, this gorgeous sort of picture, sort of a palace outside Paris. Um, and uh, the, these, uh, the uh, sets 
and the stages on which Grand Opera, Grand Opera performed were capable, if necessary, of accommodating hundreds of choruses and extras and dancers. Uh, here we have uh, Maya Beer's Le Prophète, uh, a, a picture from the first production in London, which was the same year as when Pro Le Prophète was done in 1849. Uh, and, and you can see here, um, we you get the idea of sort of the, the grandeur of Grand Opera. There are some pictures of the French production that have even more people on stage. Uh, but you can sit, get, a, get a clear idea here, of both the taste for spectacle and for chorus and also uh, for um, historical accuracy in the scenery. Uh, and here at uh, the same opera, uh, Le Prophète, um, the final scene uh, is set in a banquet and the whole stage is blown up. That was the catastrophe, which caused great delight in the, with the audience. Um, uh, grand Opera was big business. Maya Beer, who was the most successful of Grand Operatic composers, became immensely rich on the proceeds. Wagner, however, was no friend to grand opera. As a young man, he in the late, late 1830s, he had gone to Paris. He lived there for a few years to try to establish himself as a composer, but he was rejected by the operatic establishment. Meyer Beer was not nearly as helpful as Wagner has hoped he would be. And he experienced here in Paris during this stay in the 1830s uh, much that generated his anti-Gallicism and also his anti-Semitism that so marked uh, the later years of his life. He developed um, a, 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 an extreme prejudice, prejudice against the music, against Maya Beers in particular, uh, finding there's little integrity. And he famously dismissed Maya Beers music as being a series of effects without causes, uh, which is not entirely fair, uh, though but one can see uh, that there has some, it has some point to it. But even though he did not sort of um, identify himself with grand opera, he had no problem in uh, allying himself with the theatrical aspects of the form. His first major success, Rienzi, was, uh, which was first performed in Dresden in 1842, was purely in the idiom of grand opera. And it was immensely successful when it was first performed. And indeed later, it actually earned more money than almost uh, all of the other of Wagner's operas, much to Wagner's chagrin. Um, but certainly Rienzi did earn him his first major position as a Kapellmeister in the dress when it was performed there to clamorous audiences. Um, uh, grand opera uh, in, not a, in Europe was really popular everywhere. And, and Wagner um, was, and who was, was not one who would really fail to seize an opportunity. And he introduced grand operatic elements into several of his operas. In his second mature music drama, Tannhäuser, there are a number of grand operatic elements, but it was with Lohengrin uh, that he went to town. And may, may, people might uh, argue also with certain operas, The Ring, which followed the composition of Lohengrin. Um, Lohengrin was written to be performed in the Dresden Opera House, where Rienzi had been a, a sensation, uh, was well equipped for the spectacle of grand opera, and it actually fulfilled almost all the requirements of grand opera. However, it was not, in fact, first performed in Dresden because the 1849 revolution got in the way. Wagner lost his job as a Kapellmeister. Uh, he was wanted by the police and he went into exile for several years, uh, first in Zurich and then in other uh, European countries. And, Dre and uh, Lohengrin was first performed um, in Weimar not in the presence of Wagner at all. He was outside German-speaking countries. Um, it was performed at Weimar on the 28th of August, 1850. Um, and uh, it was performed on a very small stage. So potential spectacle in Lohengrin was not possible. In fact, if we look at this picture of the first act, the arrival of Lohengrin, there's sort of, uh, you know, about uh, uh, six or seven people here uh, uh, on the on the on the uh, the audience right, and then there's sort of a slightly larger grouping of people on the audience left, Lohengrin and and uh, uh, Elsa. Uh, but you really get the sense that actually this stage was really rather cramped. Um, 
it was only uh, in, in the coming decades that when Lowen became immense, immensely popular, that it moved into the larger theatres and we can get the full idea of its grand operatic nature uh, from pictures. Um, uh, in particular, uh, we have a number of pictures from productions in Munich that I'd just like to sort of uh, to show you to give you some idea of its grand operatic stature. Uh, here we have got um, the, uh, the opening scene of Lohengrin in a production in Munich dating from 1867. Uh, this is, the, you can see, the small landscape in Weimar has expanded to a much more uh, panoramic riverscape. Uh, note the bends in the river here uh, that were used to sort of uh, have Lunin come on in the swan boat. It was only a little boy when it first came on, but and then a sort of an, an adolescent, and it was only when he came to this point that we had the full adult Lohengrin figure. This was very much the sort of trick that Grandot loved. Um, but anyway, note the bends in the river, note, note the framing devices of the trees. Uh, everyone is encouraged to think of the stage as a picture. And here we have act two. Uh, from uh, a, a production just a, a, a few years later, uh, basically that sort of they just changed the scenery at times when, uh, uh, when, when, when they revived the production. And this is Act Two done by Angelo Tuqualio, um, who's who uh, uh, this is used from 1858 to 1864. This is the palace and the cathedral. Uh, note, though, the action itself of Lohengrin is set in 10th century Antwerp, but the architecture that we have here is from the high Middle Ages of the 13th and 14th century. And the reason for this was that this fit the tastes of the audience particularly well. Um, here we have a very formal picture from the uh, uh, from the the, um, the, the production uh, just a few years later uh, by Michael Echter, and it shows a greater refinement of architecture and costume, and indeed um, even a sort of a closer focus upon the 13th and the 14th century. Um, the Act Three, uh, the bedroom scene, um, is is here uh, the bridal chamber. Again, this is 1858 to 1864. Now, by our standards today, that set has absolutely zero intimacy whatsoever. There's grandiosity in all aspects of this production, and this grandiosity was the essence of grand opera. And notice, by the way, the detail in the painting. Clarity and accuracy, we better put a question mark by accuracy, but clarity and accuracy were the essence in um, uh, grand operatic sets. Now, let us move from the setting and the stage to music. Uh, uh, of all Wagner's music dramas, Lohengrin is the most formal in action. Um, their ritual events are central to much of grand opera, and ritual events are also central to Lohengrin. And in many ways, these ritual events are taken to extreme. Um, for example, the whole of Act One is structured around a trial, the trial of Elsa, and it has the formality that's associated with the trial and all the sort of the ritualistic statements also associated. Act Two is a long bridal procession to the Minster with interruptions that again is sort of is very ritualistic. Um, and Act Three um, ends with the summoning of the officer of the of the um, uh, of the, the um, armies of the warriors to war, um, but actually becomes Lohengrin's farewell. But there's a very strong ritualistic quality to that, uh, that scene as well. Um, each of these rituals are designed to express continuity, community, and the impression of social and political stability. Um, they are also ideal for choruses, and Lohengrin is indeed one of the greatest of all choral operas. Uh, this is noted above all in the preghiera or the prayer that takes place prior to the duel between Lohengrin and Telramund in Act One. Here we have a truly grand uh, um, impression of grand operatic music. <laughs> 
have something truly grand. We have a stately melody. Uh, we have a strong dependence on the brass. Uh, we have a militaristic atmosphere and a very strong sense of institutional power. And all of this was central to the appeal of grand opera because one of the functions of grand opera, particularly in uh, France, was to reinforce and to support the status quo. In other words, it was not, although there are revolutions in grand opera and uh, uh, people are often very scared of revolution in operas, it, what grand operas do is basically support the power of the state and its institutions. Now, another feature, a French feature of uh, Lohengrin is its dramaturgy. Um, the notable feature of Lohengrin is its compactness. It is probably the most tightly constructed of all grand operas. In fact, I might go even further and say it's one of the most tightly constructed of all operas ever written. It's substantially due to his dependence on a dramatic form that is very closely associated with French opera and theater and was actually often practiced by librettists of French grand opera when they were writing for the spoken theater. Um, Lohengrin basically is a fine, perhaps the finest example of the well-made play or la pièce bien faite in the operatic repertoire. This was a form of drama that was winning universal acclaim in Europe through to the 20th century. And let me just briefly say what the well-made play was. First, it was a play that, was, uh, that had a plot that centered on a secret, a secret known to the audience, but not to the characters. And of course, in Lohengrin, that secret is Lohengrin's name. Even though we are not told it, we all know before we go into the theater that in fact, his name is Lohengrin, because that's the name of the opera. Uh, uh, next, the action of well-made plays tend to be clear and logical. The all, most all well-made plays begin with exposition, where there is quite a long passage of going back into the past and explaining what has had in the past. And this is precisely the way in which the trial at the beginning of Act One, uh, 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 in Act One of uh, Lohengrin is conducted. And each act has a rising action <coughs> that leads to a climax. And this climax used to be, it was called the obligatory scene. This is the scene that everybody was waiting for. And if we look at, uh, at, at Lohengrin, we have a rising action throughout the whole of the first act, a rising action through the first part of the second act, and then a rising action through the second part of the second act. Those are two, the two parts of act two are in some ways are very, very different uh, dramatically, but both of them follow this pattern of a rising event. And, and at the same time, at the beginning of, uh, of act three, which we might call the fourth act of Lohengrin, we have the bridal scene, which is the obligatory scene where the crisis occurs. And then comes the fifth act, or, um, uh, or, or, or which leads to the denouement or the unwrapping of, uh, of, of, of um, the story. There is also in the well may play a sense of inevitability. And each of these points are perfectly demonstrated in Lohengrin. Uh, the appeal of the well may play was ultimately suspense. And even though the ending was usually foreseen by the audience, um, uh, they still had great pleasure in sort of anticipating it. How many times have I sat on the edge of my seat during a performance of Lohengrin and just sort of, you know, uh, just sort of held by what's going on, even though I know what is going to happen at the end, it still doesn't sort of in any ways break my enjoyment or concentration on, on, on the action. Oh, I should just mention one other thing is characters tend to be types more than individuals. Now, in some ways, Lohengrin significantly exceeds and goes beyond the limits of grand opera and the well-made play. And this is what I would like to focus upon next in this section, which is called the German Lohengrin. Now, a notable feature 
of French grand opera is the individual has no power to withstand the forces of history, of society, of the military. In essence, grand opera is a non-heroic genre and it's conservative as it tends to champion the status quo. Most grand operas are political and they tend to say, um, to have, as I've mentioned before, a very negative view of revolution. Now, the political uh, ramifications of Lohengrin are really quite complex. And this is where we're now moving toward the German aspect of the, uh, this. The opera is set in the city of Antwerp in the first half of the 10th century AD. The king of Germany, a gentleman by the name of Henry the Fowl of the Fowl, was actually the king of East Francia. That was technically the sort of the, 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 uh, um, the, the terrain uh, that he ruled over. Uh, but he is visiting Antwerp to uh, trying to unite the Bra uh, Brabant with his own lands um, in uh, uh, Francia and also in Saxony. Now, in 1848, when Lohengrin completed, uh, Lohen, uh, 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 sorry, when Wagner completed Lohengrin, um, Henry was actually a historical figure of great current interest. He was considered to be the founding monarch of the medieval German state. And for the nationalist advocates, German unity in Wagner's own time, in the influence in the 1850s, he was a highly symbolic figure. Um, he, he was a political unit that had not yet been achieved in Germany, but, they, but was, was to be achieved um, in, the, uh, in, in the decades to come. Um, though German nationalism, in the time that Lohengrin was uh, composed, uh, was a vigorously uh, growing movement. Um, in the 19th century, uh, the mid 19th century, it was still considered to, be, con considered to be radical and to be leftist. So Henry brought some considerable contemporary political baggage to the opera, even though he himself was a sort of a, a, a king from a very, very distant century. Wagner, was, of course, was among the most ardent advocates of German unity, and uh, Lohengrin was the opera in which he most direct, uh, directly dealt with the issue of, uh, of, of nationalism, of national unity. Um, and of course, um, he was fired from the, uh, um, uh, the Dresden Opera House, uh, where he was Kapellmeister for participating in the failed revolution of 1849, a revolution that had been motivated entirely by the desire for German unity. Now, the outer political framework of the action of Lohengrin suits the opera perfectly. Heinrich has come to Antwerp to engage the Brabantians in the German cause. And he asks them to defend the realm against hordes from the east, which is actually something that the historical Henry the Fowler actually achieved. But it's a very perilous cause, and it's a very perilous appeal, because it's quite clear from the opening act of Lohengrin that the men of Brabant are very fractious. The opening scene is marked by eruptions between them and the Saxons who have come with, uh, uh, with, with um, uh, Henry uh, the Fowler uh, to Brabant. Um, there is quite, it is rather clear that there's sort of political disarray and not very much trust among any of the, among the, 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 the warring uh, forces or the competing forces. Now, usually in grand opera, uh, the fate of the central characters, especially in, with lovers, is to suffer as passive victims of the political conflict. That is usual in French grand opera. In Lohengrin, Wagner moves beyond the conventional expectations of grand opera into a more recognizably German realm, where depth of characterization and an accompanying sense of mysticism and power that could lie within the individual is a notable feature. 
as the action progresses, it is not external circumstances that actually determine the course of action, but internal ones. The crisis uh, that occurs in Act Two and Act Three um, arises from Telramund's sense of helplessness, from Ortrud's ambition to rule Brabant, from Elsa's love for Lohengrin, but, the, it, the, but this love that is destroyed by her lack of trust in Lohengrin. And also is driven by Lohengrin's desire to find a human partner. These are the forces, these personal forces, uh, um, the score and the poem tell us are the determining factors in the action that takes place on the stage. Not treaties, not judgments, not edicts of church and state. And that is a perspective that is very, very unfamiliar uh, in, in French grand opera. This is something that Wagner himself seems to bring to, uh, to, to, to grand opera. Uh, but I think the special richness of Lohengrin lies in this alliance of French form and German content. Um, the central action of Lohengrin's marriage to Elsa and its undermining by Ortrud and Telramund engages precisely at a personal level with the larger public theme. There is no trust between Brabant and Saxony. There is no trust at the personal level, even ultimately between people who love each other. Uh, trust is what this opera is about and the need for trust and what happens when trust is corrupted and breaks. That it seems to me is the central issue of Lohengrin. And the personal uh, crisis of trust throws a strong and urgent light on the political. It, it's a unifying theme between the public and the private that is very rare to find in French grand opera on its own. Now, this distinction and ultimately this unification of the personal and the public um, is clearly indicated in the music. Um, the, and, and let me now go through each of the sort of the major characters. There's one character in Lohengrin who belongs fully to grand opera and to the public side of matters, and that is King Henry or König Heinrich. He's there to keep order and to guarantee um, uh, some sort of political status quo. And whenever he sings, he tends to sing with authority and strong rhythms. Here we have him at the start of the opera. Much of the opening and the closing scenes, the trial of Elsa at the beginning in Act One, and the summoning of the warriors to war at the end of the opera, um, is clearly music that belongs to grand opera. It is strong, it is rhythmic, it has authority, it has a sort of a certain degree of confidence. Um, it's militaristic, there's balance and symmetry in the music, and the brass is prominent. And I'm not going to play it, but I'd suggest that you might want to play the uh, interlude uh, in Act Three between the two scenes of Act Three, um, which is uh, the the which is an interlude that, in fact, describes the troops summoning on the bank of the river, and it is uh, one of the grandest and one of the most savage pieces of war music ever written. 
So Wagner really emphasized this sort of uh, sort of the the the, um, uh, the 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 rather threatening uh, grand operatic sort of um, uh, context of the action. Um, but the four central characters, Heinrich's a little bit to the side. The four central characters each have their own music, which which makes them stand out from the grand operatic background. The most distinctive of these, of course, is Lohengrin. Uh, Lohengrin is normally sung by a Helden tenor, um, uh, with, but he normally has a very high tessitura. So there's, set, there's a sense of unworldliness about him from the moment he appears. Uh, this is most apparent at his first appearance with the swan. High strings are constantly associated with Lohengrin, which suggests the realm of the grail from which he has come. And it's remarkable how it, his music affects others, which is why I just added a little bit of the chorus afterwards. The chorus has a large role in, in, in Lohengrin, and only just a few minutes before we've heard them really in sort of in quite a cantankerous mood, now suddenly we hear how they are smoothed out and peace is brought by the appearance of Lohengrin. Uh, it's remarkable how Lohengrin's music does affect other characters. Um, the chorus has, as I say, a very large role in, 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 in Lohengrin, and it very often takes on the music associated with a character, so we feel that music of the, of the character as a moving force in the action. It's an essential tie between the private and the public. Elsa is the central character in the work, and that's not just me, that's Wagner saying so. Um, he, uh, she has a wider range of emotion than Lohengrin, uh, but her music tends on the whole to be aligned with Lohengrin. It is also tends to be of a very high tessitura, and it's expressive of a deep sense of goodness accented by piety and love for Lohengrin. It has a greater warmth and a greater power to move. This is actually my favorite moment in the opera. This is where um, Elsa takes in Ortrud uh, to her, um, into her, uh, her bridal procession uh, before going to the Minster. Mm -hmm. 
Elsa tends to have a similar impact to Lohengrin. Her goodness spreads to others and is felt as an active force in the action, uh, but of course all the more painful when, when she goes through that dreadful crisis in uh, Act 3 and or, or um, perhaps we might call it in, in, the, in Act 4, uh, when she goes through uh, that crisis and loses her trust in Lohengrin and asks him the question. But the fascinating aspect of the opera is that Wagner's most innovative music is dedicated to the two villains of the piece. Um, Lohengrin himself, as a character, fits quite well into the French grand, grand operatic world. Uh, he's um, perhaps more an icon than he is a character. Um, Wagner had problems with him. Uh, he felt he could never fully warm to him as a character. He was too distant. He was like a wooden effigy. Elsa, he found far more sympathetic. That's why he considered her the central character of the work. Um, because the entire work really centers around her dilemma. Uh, but Ortrud and Telramund are perhaps the most fascinating characters and the ones who have the most interesting music. A crucial scene is Act 2, Scene 1. This is the one in the dark um, um, in, in, in the, uh, the, the Minster Square, um, of the scene that I often refer to just as Act 2, uh, when uh, Ortrud persuades Friedrich to join the plot that will destroy the marriage. And Ortrud persuades Telramund that Lohengrin is a magic figure whose power can be destroyed and suggests that Elsa will ask him the questions which will lead to the breakup of the marriage. And here is the passage where she introduces the idea, and we get a sense that the music is very, very different than the music that we have heard so far, and in fact com uh, composes much of the opera. Well, of course, this is uncannily prescient of the music for the ring. Um, the light motif that suggests trickery actually is, uh, it anticipates light motifs of sleep that we are going to be hearing in the ring uh, some years later. Uh, there's a nagging light motif that in it sort of it is sort of uh, indicative of Telramund's weakness that is related to the melody that um, Lo Lohengrin has always already sung in Act One, relating to the question as to whether as to what his name is. Um, we should note that the melody is no longer structural. The music is determined by the content of the poem. 
uh, the musical style is much more con conversational than previous and subsequent passages. Here we actually feel that Wagner is moving towards psychological drama and Ortrud and Tellerman anticipate figures from the psychological drama of the later 19th century. They are the most interesting figures and at least in terms of sort of the dramatic and musical tradition, they are in some ways the most progressive. So finally, in conclusion, a Franco-German alliance or a misalliance? I've emphasized an alliance common to see Wagner as an antipathy to all the thing, all things French in opera, uh, but this is not the case at all. Um, his earlier grand operatic exercises were either, the, uh, were either gigantic and uh, too strongly influenced by the French, Rienzi is a good example, or they were deeply concerned with personal questions that didn't entirely fit, uh, fit grand operatic structure and, and caused puzzlement among audiences. But Lohengrin brings the two sides together, the sides of France and Germany, uh, with remarkable harmony. Uh, as Liszt said, the uh, opera is an indivisible wonder. Um, so what's the consequence of all this? Well, the function of the well-made play is to give a closed ending with all questions answered, so the audience leaves satisfied that they know that the world is in order. Like grand opera, the well-made play supports the status quo. And when you left the grand opera, you were supposed to be filled with comp for the status quo. But crucially, Lohengrin does not do this. It does not actually ultimately give a vision of a unified world. One thing we tend to forget as the action progresses is that Heinrich is in Brabant to ask the Brabantians to help him defend Germany from the Eastern hordes. After the poetry and then the brutal drama of the wedding night, the sudden gathering um, at the end of the opera is a shock. We're suddenly brought from the personal back into the violent public life again. Uh, it's interesting when Lohengrin comes and tells everybody who he is, where he has come from, his father's Parsifal and, and, and all that, um, he actually decides, he actually informs people, I'm not going to take the position of protector of Brabant as I had promised. Instead, I must withdraw because Elsa's breach of trust in me signifies a wider breach of trust that should bind leaders to the societies they lead. If Elsa had trusted him, the logic is that then he would have become the leader to defend Germany against hordes from the East. The romantic plot does not end in harmony, but with the necessary sundering of husband and wife in what is actually the most bleakly tragic ending in all of Wagner. Uh, the political plot um, is also unresolved. Lohengrin refused to serve as the protector of Brabant. Instead, he announces that Germany will never be invaded by hordes in the East, and then re restores Gottfried without explaining why he was taken away from the Brabantians in the first place. And the question of leadership goes unresolved. In other words, um, the sort of closed ending that was acceptable in both the well-made play and in grand opera is here taken away from us. For some, this indeterminate ending is problematic. Uh, the politics need to have a strong as a resolution as the romantic plot. But I would suggest that this was not Wagner's aim. He brings the ger current German political situation, the need for political unity to mind in the grand operatic aspects of the work, but he shows how the realities of human emotion can undermine that uh, unity in the private plot. So while arguably the purpose of the well-made play and the grand opera is to speak to and reassure closed minds, the purpose of Lohengrin is, I think, to open them. Thank you very much.